Father, we thank you for allowing us to have some time today to look in your word. We thank you that we had opportunity to worship you with song and just to be in that place where you put us, Lord, to have a heart to receive. And we thank you for that wonderful, sweet time of worship. And now as we gather, Lord, we look to you to teach us, to instruct us, to take your word and apply it deep into our hearts. Where there you'll make the application of your word and our lives will be changed. So we thank you. May we see and know you in a greater way and be drawn to you closer and closer. We thank you for this time together. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in Galatians chapter 4. As we move through the book of Galatians, we are constantly reminded that the Galatians were brought to the knowledge of Christ as Paul would travel through and bring forth the grace of the gospel. The understanding that Jesus Christ paid the price in full for our sin when he died on the cross at Calvary. That man cannot add to what God has done. God has done that work. And they had that foundation in that. And then, because of people that drifted in, we call them Judaizers, they came in and they said, well, that's well and good, God did open that door, but you will need to keep the law to truly be saved, to be God's people. And Paul comes back and says, how quickly your minds have been corrupted and how quickly you've grabbed a hold of another gospel, which isn't even a gospel. It's not truth and it's definitely not good news. And so he builds a case and shows them that the law for the Jews was there as a school teacher, or we call it a school master, a tutor. But deeper than that, it would be one that would come and teach and discipline and correct. And he uses the analogy of how a child, though they are heir to their father's estate, that when they are a child, they need to be taught and trained. But when they come to that age of maturity, then they can walk in the fullness of being that heir, of being that son, or as we would also, in our understanding, daughter. They use the word son only because that, in that culture, is how the inheritance was passed down primarily. But God had no problem passing down the inheritance to the daughters of well, as you see in Scripture. So I'll interchange those words a lot. But here, as children of God, we now can walk in this place of maturity. And yet, they chose to go back to a place of basically servanthood or or a lesser state in the house instead of an heir. They, they chose to go backwards, and, and it befuddles Paul, and he's like, I can't understand why. So he lays out these things before us, and we're really at, a, a, at the meat of it here in chapter 4, because he really emphasizes that God has brought us to this place of maturity and indeed, you are his sons, you are his daughters, with the full benefits of that relationship. And so he's trying to tell them, why don't you walk on in this place of maturity instead of falling back into this place of childhood. And he begins here in chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, and he says, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differ nothing from a servant, 
though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. So he's telling the Galatians here and giving them the understanding, and we talked about a lot of this last week, but that the law, the Mosaic law, was this type of schoolmaster. It, it were these tutors and governors for the youth, if you would. And even though that they needed to walk by faith, and they did, and they lived for an expectation of Messiah to come, they were never totally free to walk as God's sons and daughters, never totally free to be his heirs. They were more like servants. And so he declares this to them, and they had to be disciplined by the law. They had to be trained by the law. They had to be governed by the law until that time of maturity would come when the father would say, it's time to now be my son or daughter or to walk in that role, I should say. It is now time to take that responsibility in the family and with all of its blessings and responsibility, it is time for you to mature into that role or because you are now mature to be offered that role in the family. This maturity that Paul's speaking of is the maturity that came when Jesus Christ descended from heaven, was born of the Virgin Mary, became man, lived a perfect life that you and I cannot live, but died a sinner's death, he who had no sin, but he died in our place and then was raised from the dead. So that moment of a tr uh, maturity has now come for them. This should be a time of celebration. Your, your moment of maturity has come. You, you are now able to be free from that childlike behavior of, Always being told, don't do this, stop doing that, you can't do this. Would you just sit up straight? You know, when you were a child, you looked forward for that day of maturity. And we're like, I want to be independent, I want to do more things. I, 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 I want to eat ice cream before my dinner. And now that I'm adult, I can and now that I'm older, I can't. <laughs> Not as much. But you look forward to being a mature person. And, and he's like, now this time has come. This moment you've been waiting for is here. And for some reason, they wanted to go back in the childhood behavior of not being counted as heirs to God, but ch children that are governed and directed by the law, by the as, the, as the scripture says, the elements of this world. For the Jews, that was the Mosaic law. For others that were non-Jews, it was whatever their elements of this world, the things that would guide them, their religions their practices, their, their governments. Natural law, basically, you know, you're governed by these things. You, if, if you climb up on a high peak and jump, you will not fly. I don't care if you put on a cape and an S on your shirt, you're not flying. You are governed by the elements of this world. And again, for the Jews, it was the Mosaic Law. That's what governed them. And he's saying that is what happened, but there is a time coming where all of that was put in place, but now you're stepping out in faith, in maturity, trusting in the one who truly governs your life, 
the one who has brought you into this place, the one who has given you his spirit. And you can now walk in that freedom as mature adults in Christ. You can walk in that freedom of a relationship with God as his children, but as heirs to his kingdom or what he has. And, and with all of its benefits and responsibilities, but you can walk in that now. And he was baffled on the fact that that, that moment has finally come and, and you finally made it, but for some reason you want to go back sucking your thumb? It doesn't make sense. And so he continues and he says in verse 4, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son and made of woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that they may receive the adoption of sons. That now is the time come that you're no longer under the law, no longer as little children being, you know, moved and guided. And you're in a place of maturity. And God has now, through His Son, Jesus Christ, brought you in a place where you can be accepted as a son or as a daughter of God. A adopted by God. This, this adoption, see, we think of adoption, we think of adopting little babies. But this adoption is adoption of maturity. Because that's what it was. You were, you were, the appointed time of your maturity, and that time was when Christ would come, and then the message of the gospel came, and, and God had tapped you, pointed you out, gave you the gospel, and all you did is receive it by faith, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. But now you're brought into this wonderful relationship of, of, of family with God, of sonship and daughtership with the Most High. And, and it, it's, it's a place of maturity. You know, I had, I had that experience physically on earth in my life when when i was four years old my dad my birth dad my biological dad died in an accident horrible accident got crushed horrible accident so my mom raised three kids I was a middle child. She, six years later when I was 10, met a guy who I called dad. Great man. And he fathered us. But he didn't adopt us. He, he respected our family line and wanted us to keep the name Dudek to continue on. Very great man, but he loved us with a, a very great love. Now, it was hard on him at first, if you think of this single guy coming in with three kids. And of course, I was the angel, but my two sisters. <laughs> and it was very, very difficult for him. I tried to help him out. But in this, he, he adjusted, he adapted, he, he learned, and he taught, and he fathered, and he loved, and he nurtured. And so the relationship was great. When I was in my 50s, my dad said, Kirk, I want to formally adopt you. I said, Dad, you're my dad. He goes, I know, I don't mean like as a child and name changes. 
but I want everything that legally would be mine to make sure there's no problem at being yours and that you would have full authority over my affairs. And I said, I'll be honored, Dad. And so he drew it up and he adopted us. I got all the paperwork. He was living in Florida at the time. I'm conversing with the loyal lawyer. I got all the paperwork. I sign it. I send it in. The judge actually calls me from the courthouse and say, is this Kirk du Daniel Dudek? You know, full formal. Yes, this is Kirk Daniel Dudek. You know. And he goes, well, you were here on this conference call because Kenneth Anderson would like to formally adopt you as his son. Is this something you agree to? And I'm like, I am more than agreed to it. I am honored by it. And so he had his hearing, he, he made his decision, and the adoption took place. I was a mature adult, but that meant everything to me. And it entered me into a relationship with my dad that, that, that extended his already deep love it, it extended it in my deeper understanding of that love. And, and it also gave the ability to handle his affairs as would be needed without any question. That's what God has done for you. That's what he's done for you through Jesus Christ. And he has brought you into this, this wonderful place and Paul could not imagine why the Galatians would want to go back and be little children directed and governed about by, by others or by the law instead of stepping into the full-fledged maturity with all that it holds of being a son or a daughter of the Most High God. And so he was baffled. He, he, he didn't understand this at all. And, and when I thought about this, I, I thought about at holidays, we, uh, we get together, our family. And we get together, usually we get together more than this, but we get together at the big holidays of Thanksgiving and Christmas and Easter. And when we get together, we have quite a crew. We have usually 30-plus people that are gathered together. And so we're all together, and we set up all these tables, you know, and we link them all together, and we have this big table. And we have this other table set up that stretches across. This is called the kids' table, all right? This is the adults' table. So this is the format that we have. The kids at the kids' table, you know, they're happy, they're going, you know, loving it and everything. But there's a certain age as your kids grow up, they don't want to be at the kids' table any longer. And, and they will say, do I have to be at the kids' table, you know? And we're like, well, maybe just one more year. Be a good example to the others, you know. Actually, help babysit because they drive me nuts too. And it's like, be a good example. And then the next year comes, I forgot all about it. They didn't forget. Dad, you said this is my year to be at the adults' table. And I'm like, all right, we just had that not too long ago. Okay, Dustin. <laughs> you could, <laughs> I could say it. He's, he's with his girlfriend at their church this week. But I'm like, okay, Dustin, you know. You, uh, you can be there this year. And so he sits at the adult table. And, and I couldn't imagine, after a short period of time, Dad saying, or Dustin saying, Dad, can I move my seat from the adult table back to the table of chaos and annoyance? 
you know, can I please move my chair back? I never heard that from him. He was glad to get away from that kid table. He was very pleased to sit among the adults. And that's why Paul's like, why are you Galatians wanting to go back to a table of chaos when God's brought you to the communion table? Why, why would you go back? And so he's appealing to them. He's, he's encouraging them that you don't want to go back. God's brought you into this beautiful place. You don't, you don't want to find yourself back as a, as a child in this relationship. You want to finally come forth as an heir of God and a joint heir of Jesus Christ. That's what you want to do. That's what God has for you. And so he, he is a little baffled by their, their desire in going backwards. And look what it says in verse 6. It says, And because you are sons, and we know, and daughters, God has sent forth his spirit, the spirit of his son, into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You know, we can ask God for the Holy Spirit. The scripture says, if you ask your father for bread, he's not going to give you a stone. How much more if you ask your heavenly father for the Spirit, will he not give you the Holy Spirit? We also know, according to Ephesians, that when we come to the saving knowledge of Christ and believe on the Lord, that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. I think this mention of the Spirit is a little, little more special. It's different. Because it says he has given you the Spirit of his Son. That, that you now have the fullness and the relationship that his Son has with the Heavenly Father because he's given you the Spirit of his Son Wherefore, you can cry out, Abba, Father, just like Jesus. It, 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 it's, it, he's given us that very nature of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, with the relationship that he has. He's given you that self-same spirit, wherefore you too can cry, Abba, Father. It, it, it's, a, it's an incredible thing that he's bestowed upon us. And it declares in that understanding this term Abba Father as a, a very personal term. Now technically we refer to that term as daddy. In, in the Jews wouldn't, they would refer to it as dad. And, and the reason only because when they refer to as father in that understanding, there was a high level of respect and fear for father. I mean, father was, you know, that's, that's a high place of reverence and honor. So to step to a place of dad was a huge jump for them to come to a place of being able to say dad because everything was very respectful, you know. But now you can say, Dad, that was personal. That was tender. Uh, we don't have that big of a jump, so it's fine for our understanding if we move from Father to Daddy. Because we understand Daddy, you know. Daddy is very more tender and, and you know, compassionate or has a, a, a lot of feeling behind it. Because we can still say, yeah, that's my dad over there. And, and not get the fullness of, of that personal touch. But if I say, that's my daddy over there, that, that, that gives it. So 
here, but yet God coupled this term, you got to understand, he didn't just say you can call him dad or daddy, it's daddy father. It still keeps God in a high place of honor, but yet with a personal relationship. It's an incredible term to be able to say Abba, Father. Father is still a, a, a very, is used here as a very respectful term. In fact, it, it's the same term that, that Jesus has declared to us as when we're called to, to pray, our Father. It's a, it's a high level of respect, but it's attached with a familiar personal touch, Abba. So it's Abba Father. This spirit that he has put inside us, the spirit of Christ, is what has given us that ability now to be in that personal place with the Heavenly Father. In fact, if you, if you recall, Jesus prayed this kind of relationship in John 17 when, when the Lord prayed for us. Let's turn there for a moment. In John 17, I just want to read a couple verses. But I think it's important to read. John 17... Jesus is praying for his disciples, and you kind of see in, in verse 20, he's not only praying for his disciples, but he's praying for us as well. Because in verse 20 of John 17, it says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That's us. That they may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. This oneness with God, this spirit of his Son in us, is something of that adoption, if you would. It's that adoption where we too can now cry, Abba, Abba Father. Because his spirit is in us and we're one with him and we have that right. In fact, we know the scripture says, not only are we heirs, but we are joint heirs with Christ, God's son. So we now have been placed into this awesome position with God and the enemy hates it. He hates you being in that position. So if he can entrap you with some legalistic role to put you back into this servanthood place of bondage or childlike relationship, then he is happy as he can be. But I have found for the most part that that's not the way Satan operates I have found that Satan, what he tries to do is he tries to discourage me from feeling that I have a right or have the, the ability to be in that close relationship with God. He, he discourages us in that. Back in Galatians 4, verse 7 says, where thou art no, no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Satan does not want you to know that you are an heir of God. Satan does not want you to be able to express from your heart, Abba, Father. Satan wants to beat you up and keep you down where you feel, I can't approach God 
because of whatever I've done or my thoughts or my feelings or my attitude. And God says, no, you are no longer a servant. Once I bring you to myself, as the Father draws us, and realize you're at that place, now I can draw you to me, and you receive me and accept me, you are placed in a status of a, of a son and a daughter, an heir of God. And Satan does everything he can to stop that. And I think, oh, I'm not, you know, and I just feel beaten up like a beat-down servant or an old-time slave. But remember in John 15, if you remember what Jesus said, Jesus said, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. And so the enemy does whatever he can to, to hammer us, to beat us down, to put us in a a horrible state, a horrible place where we don't feel like sons and daughters of God. We don't walk as sons and daughters of God. We don't live like sons and daughters of God. And he hammers and hammers and says, what do you think, who do you think you are? You think you're a son of God, a, a, a daughter of God after the things you've been doing, the things that you've been saying, the thoughts that are in your head, and he tries to kill us and, and, and hammer us. And your attitude, God doesn't even appreciate. You know, I don't even know if you're going to make it to heaven the way you've been living. And he continues to beat us up and beat us up. And we feel dejected. We feel de depressed. We feel in great despair. And it might be because of our sin. It might be because of an attitude or a hurt that's been Afflicted upon us but we're in this place and we're like man i don't know if i'm even gonna i don't even know if i'm saved anymore and satan says you know if the rapture happens today you're going to be left behind and the enemy hammers you and hammers you over these things because he knows i can't take away your eternal life. But I'm sure going to stop you from walking in abundant life. And Paul says, you're not a servant. You're not a second class relative of God. You're his son. You're his daughter. And those things are powerful to hold on to and to realize and then to learn to walk in and to experience in your life. But the enemy does everything he can because he doesn't walk you walking as sons or daughters. In fact, the world does everything it can Keep us from living out the fullness of that relationship with God. Always feeling depressed and oppressed and head hanging down instead of realizing he has taken you and moved you. He, he's promoted you. you. You're not a little child at the kids' table. You're, you're able to be in full fellowship with him. In fact, there, there's a story I'd like to touch on. And, and it's the story of the prodigal son. Turn to Luke, chapter 15. Luke 15. We'll begin in verse 11. And Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto him his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together 
and he took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. The son was driven by his own desires. Kind of like we are at times where our old nature just just rears it up and, and then begins to want to control our life. And we find ourselves moving out of the relationship of God as his son and we move out of that by whatever means or whatever avenue Satan has, has done to get us away from the Father. He's done it. With this man, it was riotous living. It was desire for self. With others, it's, it's shame for the past. With, with some, it's just despair from the present. But whatever Satan does, he tries to move us out of this family relationship, this, this beautiful position with God the Father, and he brings us out into the world, and there he does his number and hammers us. And he did it to this prodigal. And he wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. But I have found over the years, every time the enemy has pulled me out of that beautiful relationship with God as his son, as an heir, as a joint heir with Christ, to seek whatever I think I want, or to wallow in whatever despair I'm in, it always leaves you empty. It always does. And he began to be in want. And, and I hope that I've learned that that is not the place for me to go when things are hard. I don't need to go to a place that never has helped me before. It's only kept me away from the help that I really need. And he brings you into that place. And, and, and you've tried the things of the world. You've tried the fulfilling of your own lust and pleasure and desire. But it leaves you empty. And you're never really experiencing the fullness of the life that God has intended for you to live. And so he was in this place and he began to be in want. And he joined himself to the citizens of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed the swine. And he would have feigned have filled his belly with the husk that the swines did eat, and no man gave unto them. You see what Satan did to this prodigal? He moved from being a son to, to being more like a swine, like a, a, a pig of the earth, barely getting by. And I am tired of seeing Satan move sons and daughters out of the relationship that God has for them into a world or a, a, a darkness or a place of despair where they can never be healed, never obtain, never receive. But that's where this prodigal went. In verse 17, and when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father have bread enough to eat and spare, or enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. He said, I will rise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired 
servants. Because of this place, he thought, okay, maybe I can come back to God. Maybe I can come back to my Father. But I can never be his son or his daughter. Not after the path that I went down. Not after the road I traveled. Not after the things I did or the thoughts I had. Not after the state of depression I was in. I can never be his daughter or his son. And the enemy's like, okay, you're going back, but you're not going back in the fullness of what the Father has for you. You're going to go back and you're going to hang your head down for your entire existence. That's what Satan wants to do. And so he journeyed back. And he started to travel back. And he arose in verse 20 and he came to his father but when he was yet a gray, great far off or way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. You know what, prodigal son, distant daughter? You forgot just how much compassion the Lord has. He is full of compassion. He is full of mercy. And the depth of his love, you haven't even scratched the surface of it. But you forgot. But at least you're on your way back for him to remind you, for him to show you. And so he came back and he, and he knelt before the Father and, and he probably thought, he may not even want me as his servant. I, I may not even be even allowed on his property. And to experience the Father grabbing him, nestling upon his neck and kissing him, never thought that would happen. But that's the Father's love. That's the position that this son was in. In, in fact, you see that as it, as it moves on, he continues his speech, and he says, The son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight, and am I in no worthy, I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the Father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, put it on him, and put on the ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. I want you to clothe him once again as my son, as my heir. I want you to clothe him once again. He forgot who he was. He's not a servant. This is my son. This is my daughter. And he said, bring these things and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. The father said, this my son was dead but now alive. Basically, this my son was lost but now found. You see, the son's position in the father's eyes and in the father's heart never changed. He was always his son. You are always his daughter. That position has not changed. And they began to eat and they began to make merry. 
I want you to know that the Father has never stopped loving you. Never changed his mind. Never diminished your position with him. And if you're finding your way back to the Father, he is very, very glad. And I pray that as you come this day, that you would allow him to bestow his love upon you to bring you back into that place that he has always recognized upon you. For my son is alive and back home. My daughter is alive and back home. And with that understanding, I hope that you can make merry that you can now walk in the abundance of the life that he truly has for you. Because he truly has it for you. Why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you have such an incredible love and heart of compassion for we, your sons and your daughters that have lost our way and over time lose our way. But we know the home that we need to find ourselves in. And that's our Father's house. So I thank you, Lord, that when we turn our feet to go back home, you are there embracing, loving, and rejoicing that your son or your daughter is back with you again. May you teach us to walk in the fullness of the relationship that you truly have secured for us through the cross of your Son. We love you. We praise you. We ask that you would forgive us and restore us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.